James Glick is here today to speak about his new book, The Information, A History, A Theory, A Flood. It's been called a, rel a revelatory chronicle that shows us how information has become the modern era's defining quality. Uh, in this work, he refers to the alphabet as a founding technology of information. Uh, the telephone, the fax machine, calculator, and ultimately the computer are only the latest innovations on that, uh, devised for saving, manipulating, and communicating knowledge. Unafraid of grappling with the sometimes extremely dense scientific theories behind, uh, behind his work, this well-researched yet very approachable book is sure to be an instant success, much like his previous bestsellers, uh, Chaos, which helped popularize, uh, popularize the chaos theory, among other ideas, in the mid-90s, and Genius, a biography of legendary physicist Richard Feynman. He's a leading chronicler of science and modern technology, and we're very happy to have him at Google today. So please welcome today's author, James Blake. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for having me here. Um, I've, been, I've been here before because I was involved with uh, some of the negotiations over the lawsuit against Google over the copying of, of all those copyrighted books. And I had fun then, and I'm, I'm glad to be back. And I, I'm really glad, I'm a little surprised to see so many people buying um, my book in this uh, <laughs> quaint format. <laughs> um, Google makes a brief appearance at the end of my book. When I began writing it, I actually imagined that I would do a lot of reporting here and, and that Google would be sort of a big feature of the end of the book, and it didn't work out that way. Uh, Wikipedia, there's much more about Wikipedia in the book than there is about Google, and in a way I think it's because it became unnecessary. Um, you are so ubiquitous. You're so much a part of people's lives. I don't need to tell you. The premise of the book is, to put it here in a way I don't usually put it, that the road that leads here, the road that leads to Google, begins at a particular point in the middle of the 20th century, in 1948, with the publication, almost full-blown, of what was quickly referred to as information theory by Claude Shannon at Bell Labs um, in the form of uh, a pair of technical articles in the, in the Bell Systems Technical Journal. Bell, yeah, Bell Systems Technical Journal. And then it was republished as a book, The Mathematical Theory of Communication. And do you have it? Do, have you, do any of you own it? It's, it's a few people. Uh, I would think at a place like this it should be a sort of I think that there's a lot in it that is relevant to all of you, whatever part of the business you happen to be in. I first heard about it um, from chaos scientists when I was working on my first book. Uh, and I remember, even though it was quite a while ago, being somewhat taken aback by the, just the idea that there was such a thing as information theory, as a mathematical theory of something that I thought of as being not a natural subject for mathematical analysis, this vague amorphous thing called information. Now, as I hardly need tell you, we live in a world where information is not just instructions, news, gossip, it's not even just words. It's in a big thing that includes music and images and anything that you can digitize and store on a computer and search via Google. Um, there's a connection between these things. I believe that Shannon's theory, Shannon's and then all of the work that followed it by mathematicians and soon after computer scientists lie underneath the structure of our world, not just as a technical foundation, but also in a more, in a more genuine way, in a, in a broader way. I'm, I'm trying to avoid using the word in a philosophical way. With this premise, then, I, then the structure of my book is also 
Uh, it also involves going back in time to the beginning of human history with the view that the information age isn't just the thing that we've been talking about for 50 years, and it is 50 years, by the way, according to the Oxford English Dictionary. The information age um, is an expression that first started getting tossed around in 1960. Um, but all of human history is an information age. We know that now. The printing press is an information technology. The telegraph, the telephone, and at the beginning of recorded history, the alphabet. So that's the, the basic idea of my book. It was a little bit difficult to organize. The story starts at the beginning. That is, the story starts in the middle in 1948 and then goes back and then goes forward. Um, I don't want to give a lecture about it here. I would rather have a sort of conversation because I feel I should be, I still sort of feel I should be interviewing you. So, but, so let me, let me start with a, a sort of question. Um, I used to work at the New York Times. That was where I began my career. And the New York Times was a great information enterprise, and still is. Something that uh, uh, some wise old head at the Times used to say was that what the reader is paying for is not all of the news we put in all the news that's fit to print. What the reader is paying for is all the news that we leave out. If you were a typical New York Times reader in a previous generation, the New York Times might have been your only source of information. I mean, I remember my grandfather reading it on the subway, and there was a certain way you had to fold it in order to read it on the subway. Otherwise, you just end up in a big tangle of paper. And, and in there was a time when that way of folding the New York Times was taught in school. But it was finite, famously. It was made of paper, and it was only so big. And the, the conceit of the editors of the Times was that if you read the whole thing, you were up to date on the news. Not only that. The front page was, as, as you may know, it still is, highly structured. Uh, a huge amount of discussion, formal discussion, took place every day about what news article should lead the paper, that is, be placed in the upper right corner, and what was the second most important article, which should be the off lead in the upper left, and, and which stories were worthy of um, headlines above the fold or below the fold, and whether headlines should be two columns or three columns or more. And um, this judgment, uh, the, the exercise of judgment that was involved here was called news judgment. And editors at the Times were very proud of possessing this quality of news judgment and knowing, for example, that the murder of a human being um, was not a fixed quality, that, uh, that some murders of human beings could be completely unimportant and not even worth mentioning, virtually all of them, in fact. But if the human being happened to be um, a doctor living in Scarsdale who was the famous author of a, a diet book, and the uh, accused murderer happened to be his spurned lover, a Scarsdale matron, um, well, that was a really important murder. And, they, and the Times did not apologize for making these judgments. This is all leading up to a question. <laughs> it seems to me that Google, which is famously a search engine, just as much as the, New, the possibly mythical New York Times that I'm describing, is also um, based upon filtering that um, the purpose you serve is not just to pull information from the internet and present it to the reader, it's to filter out the information that the user is not looking for. Just as the New York Times was filtering out all of that news that users of the internet, internet today so often complain is bombarding them. On the one hand, everybody is thrilled that they no longer have to rely on stodgy, 
authoritative, anti-democratic. I gave a talk um, last night in Berkeley uh, that was not like what I'm saying tonight, but at some point I used the word democratic in a, there was, I was setting up some sort of dichotomy between democratic things on the internet and authoritative things and a woman yelled out from near the back, democracy now. <laughs> is, that, is that Berkeley? Or? Yes. <laughs> um, what was I saying? We, we, consumers of news on the internet have ambivalence, express ambivalence. On the one hand, they are delighted to be freed from the tyranny of, of, of authorities like the New York Times with their um, bourgeois or business-oriented or anti-Catholic, whatever prejudice you, have, you want to assign to the editors of the New York Times um, biases, and um, empowered by the millions of blogs and other websites and other sources of what we may or may not call news, depending on whether we want to be snobs, but the same people often complain then, how do I know what's true, how do I know what's false, how do I find what's meaningful for me? Now I know that Google has a, a big, I don't know if you call it a news operation, but there's Google News and um, I take it that it is um, either entirely automated, algorithmic, crowdsourced, or at least mostly that there's not much inter intervention from human editors. Um, I think it's, there's a great experiment underway on whether intelligent crowdsourcing, if that's what you call it here, or algorithmic approaches to deciding what really matters to the user can be better than the old-fashioned human counterparts which include the New York Times or a book publisher. People used to buy books based on uh, the name of the publisher. My publisher is Pantheon. Some people are old enough to associate that name with a certain kind of writing. That's more or less obsolete these days. I don't think many people buy books based on what the, the publisher is, is willing to choose to publish. Um, um, an editor of a poetry journal is an authoritative source, anti-democratic. But every blogger, of course, is, is anti-democratic in, in his or her own way. is making personal judgments that you can choose to trust or not trust. So, um, so that's, the, that's my question. I'd love to hear from anybody who might agree or disagree that Google's primary function is filtering and not searching. Uh, it's an excellent question. I'm sure everybody's got their own answer. I'd like to just start with maybe a back and forth repartee on this. Uh, because you bring up two subjects that we have specific names for them. You mentioned one of them, which is authority. And the other, with it, which I think is loosely referred here as curation, which is to say the editor, the, the chooser of what is important to read and what is not. Uh, What's the word again? Uh, like a, a curator. Oh, someone curation. who, who okay. is, is yeah. choosing, selecting what ought to be kept, what is mm -hmm. valuable and what's not valuable. And, and it's a, a single source or a few sources you may go to uh, to depend on, on what it is you need to know. Uh, as, as I, I'd like to hear first your thought on uh, the quality of, what your perceived quality is of, the, of crowdsource crowdsource curation, and uh, in lieu of a new era where everybody has access to be a publisher, or at least a, a recommender of lists, how do we decide who is a good curator and a bad curator? Everybody has a microphone now, and so who, who, what curators should we be looking to and what flags should we be looking for? Yeah, well, this is the problem. There's no good solution to this problem that I, that I know of. That's why I was hoping you would, you would tell me. I mean, I think, so first of all, I'll give you a, a straightforward answer to what, what I think is the quality of the curation in regard to news. I, don't, I think it's crap. I mean, I, I don't find Google News at all useful. Uh, it's there, it's, I've got it bookmarked. I still need the, the New York Times. The New York Times today is beginning its long delayed experiment in forcing people to pay. Um, Nobody knows how that's going to turn out. I'm praying that they can make a go of it. 
meanwhile, well, I, I don't need to rehearse the entire sad state of the newspaper industry today. That's not Google's main function. I'm, like everybody else in the world, a huge Google customer, and I find the search engine to be, I don't need to flatter you, I mean, it's, you're dominant for a good reason. It, it really works. Um, nobody else that I know of does as well. I know you've had difficulties, and I know you're making adjustments, and that's great. Um, it's fascinating to see how many ways people come up with to try to game the system. Um, it's genuinely worrisome how much of a role money plays now. I don't know what Google would look like. I, don't, I honestly don't know whether it would look different in a world where there just was no advertising involved anywhere in the picture. I know that, uh, I mean, I perceive, without having discussed it with anybody here, that a, a lot of attention is being paid to keeping a separation between advertising results and non-advertising results, and I think that's fine. Um, Nevertheless, there's a dynamic at work that's complicated that I know you're, you're, you've got to be, I mean, I infer that you've got to be aware of it, where um, everybody wants to be seen. Everybody is fighting for attention. Attention is the finite quantity now. And so even apart from buying or selling ad advertising, people try to I don't want to just say game the system or trick the search engine. People tailor their content in order to rank more highly. Analogously, the New York Times, to some extent, rearranges its offerings based on information it's getting in real time about what people like to read. That's entirely different from what I described at the beginning where editors didn't know and didn't care what people wanted to read. There was a tremendous, and I think charming, arrogance <laughs> in, involved in the editors who would sit around in a room and have a meeting and say, this is important because my years of experience in the business tell me it's important. And because even though this, this event that took place in uh, some agency in Washington yesterday looks pretty boring, and it's not going to be on TV, I know that it's planting a seed that is going to emerge in a few weeks or a few months or even a few years, and so we're going to put this on the front page. Um, often they were wrong. Often they were prejudiced. Always they were prejudiced. Um, I believe that in some way, they were producing more valuable results that way than they are if they get pushed around now by the minute-to-minute -minute feedback they get about who wants to read what. You know, they know what's the most emailed article. If they take the most emailed article and then move that up on the page, there are some things about that that are good. Sometimes the users do know more than they do, and there are some things about it that are bad, because sometimes it's just Charlie Sheen, and I don't want that. <laughs> I think the sheer existence of uh, massive publications that rely heavily on tabloids, gossip, and the fact that the New York Times is a purveyor of that, certainly not nearly as much as some others, but, but they, they participate in that game as well. Uh, yeah, the fact that they've existed long before the internet shows that popularism, to some extent, is a big part of what gave these newspapers such large circulation, besides the fact that they were one of a very, very few outlets for any news, right? The New York has such a large population. They had so few quality news sources anyway. They were just bound to get some level of popularity and therefore could be a little arrogant. But without paying some attention to what, a head, what was an attention-grabbing headline, regardless of whether or not that provided real value for the user's life, I, I think the internet has maybe uh, hyperextended that concept, but I, I don't think it's unique to to the web. And I, 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 I absolutely agree, I absolutely agree with you. You're making a very good point, and I'm I'm definitely loading the conversation here <laughs> by by describing the New York Times in this slightly mythical way. The New York Times I'm talking about is a little bit of a fictional creature, and it is you know for everybody who liked to get their news from the New York Times, there were many times more people who preferred the New York Post or the Daily News or the National Enquirer or, uh, or, and those were 
Well, you would say those were the curators that, that, they, that they chose, and that's fine. And, and, and you're right. That is very much analogous to what's happening today, where people can choose f- from among, from a menu of choices. That's fine. Um, it's really what I believe in the end, and it's why I can't, uh, it, neither in the book nor here, can I come up with a really crisp way of saying what I think is the solution to this dilemma. Because I always end up with some platitudes, you know, we are individuals and, and we're going to make individual choices. And that means choosing the bloggers that we want to follow. And the New York Times is just going to be, you know, there are, there are some bloggers I follow who, who are definitely ahead of the New York Times on some of the areas that I'm interested in. That's why I say again that that's a mythical convenience. Um, but for the main Google search engine, let's say, or for the Google News homepage, if you aren't adjusting the results based on your knowledge of each individual user, which of course is to some extent increasingly an option, how do you, how do you become all things to all people? I think that's a, a very difficult question that we're actually in the midst of answering, but I'll let uh, another question step up before you continue. So, hi. Um, hi. And to put my bias out front, um, I read the New York Times, um, and I hope that it doesn't go away. Um, and I'll pay for it um, to okay. keep it not going away. But, and, and they thank you for that. Yeah. And I, come, I also come from a family of uh, journalists, so um, that's maybe part of the reason. But to your original question, about Google News versus you know, an editor. Um, what I was always taught from family members who are editors was that an editor decides what's important for this community to know of the news that I've culled and, and gathered. Um, and so any particular paper you read has a particular belief system. The editor is an algorithm, if you will, about what's important. Um, the, the thing that, in my personal opinion, not speaking as a Google representative, that made Google important for me back in like 97 or 98, whenever I started using it, was that other search engines were starting to have inorganic results where the wall between the business side and the journalistic side was split, journalism being a loose mm-hmm. reference to algorithmic search. Um, so Google kept the ads out of the search results. And that's still, I think, a tension today because how do you keep an enterprise going that needs money, that ne- driven by advertising, and giving the user something they want, which is not necessarily what the advertiser wants. So there's that tension. So I think the question is, um, Google is more like a card catalog that's very easy to use, that helps you find things that are like the things that you tell it, um, whereas an editor is telling you what's important. And so the algorithmic difference there is um, how you decide what's important. So for Google, what's important is what's like what you gave me. Um, as opposed to what do you need to know to exist in a democracy healthily. Um, So that's the trick. And the problem with crowdsourcing, the second half of your question, is I think that crowdsourcing is very good for evening out the stupendous highs and the stupendous lows of individuals. Um, So one editor will have stupendous highs and stupendous lows in their performance, um, hopefully more highs and average level than lows, but other sources will help mitigate the lows. So bloggers, other newspapers are all ways to even out one variable signal, that editor. Um, But on the other hand, not only do they take away the lows, they take away the highs. So you may not get the brilliance of one editor's knowledge of a sphere, which is also a problem with newspapers versus Google, last piece is that um, a newspaper isn't covering all of the domains that human endeavor happens in, only at the highlights. You don't get deep DNA science, you don't get deep physics, deep computer science in the New York Times, because it's not generally applicable to all those communities. But our society is specializing more and more, so you need other sources like journals, search engines, scholarly search engines, um, that drive you towards what's important in those areas. So. That's part of the difference between which source you choose, what algorithm they use, and what breadth you expect from it. So I think you need a mixed model as the end of the day statement. Yeah, I, okay, I think that was really interesting. And, and uh, I'd like to home in on one of the many pieces of what you said. And I, you might need to come back to the microphone because I want to <laughs> ask, ask you more, well, you'll, you judge. Uh, the part about um, Google's main search engine 
giving you back something that's like what you asked for. Is that how you put it? It's, it seems to me it's a, it's a lot more complicated than that, and maybe it's a little more like what a newspaper does or a museum curator does than, than you're admitting. I mean, if I ask for whatever, if I, if I type in drinking fountains, you don't know. I'm probably, as you know very well, somewhat inept at framing the question. I actually think um, a life skill that uh, people have to develop is how to, how to use Google, how to, how to frame the question to get what you want. And, and you presumably would like that to be less of a necessary skill, right? I mean, you want people to just free associate and get what they want, but that's impossible because you're, uh, what I might want, what I might be looking for at any given moment it, it could be something very specific. You know, I might have a medical problem, or I might have something I want to buy, or I might just suddenly be curious about something. I, I know I'm, I'm only saying what you already know. Um, but, but what do you mean it's like what you put in? It's not, you're not just mirroring um, in some way the user's search phrase, drinking fountains, or horse races, or, um, how do I do something? I'm sure that must be a very common beginning of, of Google searches, even though it's none of mine. I never start a search that way. Um, you too need to get some clues. I mean, uh, part of what I'm saying is related to your final point about the New York Times not being a journal of physics. The New York Times tries to cover physics, I wrote about physics when I was working there. It happened to be my special area, but you're right. I had to write about it from, from, w with the knowledge that there was a mythical New York Times reader who had a certain level of knowledge about physics, and that was completely arbitrary. You know. um, and that meant I had to leave stuff out, and it meant I had to over-explain some things for some people. But doesn't Google have exactly that problem when somebody types something into, into that search field? You're describing the challenge that the entire company faces. You, you said it's impossible to, to know what we mean, and yet uh, I, I think certainly anybody who works on the search engine themselves, and please feel free to come back up and respond. I just didn't want to leave a dead sure. mic. I have a quick response. Oh, sure. Okay. So yeah, what I was basically alluding to is uh, the concept, in at least in the search sphere, I've heard it called homophily which is that uh, one of the main problems with recommender systems, and definitely Google has a very complex algorithm that I certainly don't understand completely, and um, the, the problem is, given the general purposeness of Google, as opposed to the New York Times, which is aimed at a general educated citizen, right, sixth grade level or above, um, so um, looking for general awareness, like Google may serve many purposes, and presumably news should be targeted so the algorithms were similar to an editor of a paper, um, but the, the thing I was alluding to basically was this concept of homophily that you end up with an echo chamber, as it's called in the blogosphere, where people only subscribe to the blogs of the people who agree with them, and there's never any dissent or constructive counterpoint. Um, so you end up with basically idiocy in some sense, right? Um, yes. And so that's one of the challenges with recommendations and search engines. It's very hard to get serendipity, whereas an editor presumably is knowledgeable across <laughs> the whole span and is interested in educating about the whole span of events that are important to the community, their audience. Okay. So uh, now this is another. This is a really key issue, and and I would argue that it's just as important again to the mythical New York Times as it is to Google. The question of serendipity. Um, in the olden days, the mythical olden days, you would read the whole paper, and so I mean, if you were so inclined, of course, not everybody did, but some people did. Some people just turned the page. The, the whole advertising model depended on that. So even if you weren't particularly interested, you would never cared in your entire life about anything that happened in India. There might have been something on page five this big that happened in India, and because you were otherwise bored and you didn't have anything else fighting for your attention and because you trusted the New York Times, you would read that, and that was serendipity. To some extent, that is lost with the modern 
online New York Times, because nobody's reading the paper in order. People tend, as you just said, to look for what they're already interested in. If they want to read about what's happening in Japan, they might you know, spend a lot of time doing that and never see a word about some serendipitous thing that they would, in it, with the technology constructed differently, have been exposed to. Does that mean, overall, in general, that people who are getting their news now, as I am, online, and not so much from printed sources, have a less serendipitous experience? I'm not sure. I'm really not. I try to I try to figure it out by looking at my own day. I mean, I certainly am seeing things accidentally, willy-nilly, that I wouldn't have seen before. And I'm able to follow paths, you know, the way you, you couldn't follow a path in a printed newspaper and see something that strikes my fancy and actually go from here to there. I'm not sure that we've lost serendipity. And I, and I don't know how that applies to Google. But um, yeah, next question. Um, yeah, I just sort of wanted to follow up, but I'm, I'm not on the search team, so uh, don't take anything I say as authoritative. But certainly in Google search, there are multiple signals that are considered. You know, people tend to think of it kind of as like, well, what's the one right answer? But there are lots of things that are considered. You know, are the sources authoritative? Are the sources popular? Uh, have the sources come from a, uh, a place that's been reliable in the past? And you know, one of my uh, early tests, this is a decade ago, but for, for whether a search engine was doing a good job or not, was I'd type in Madonna as a search. And if all I got was the singer, then that was a bad search engine. Was say again? If all I got was the, the, was no, the, oh, the Madonna? What did you type in? Pardon? I didn't hear what you type in. Oh, Madonna. OK. And if all I got was the singer, then that was a bad search engine. But if I got you know, the singer plus the Madonna in, plus, you know, the Christian Madonna or the black Madonna statue all in that page of results, then I knew that the search engine was do doing me a good job of doing a good job of trying to find, you know, what I might be looking for and would allow me to, to continue on from that point. And so I think there's a danger in looking at <clears throat> search as, as finding the right answer. And I think, you know, if you look at how the Google results page has changed, you know, you're getting um, not only text pages, but a section of images. Um, you can filter by whether you want news, by whether you want blogs that, that return those results um, or not. And, yeah. and I think that's, that's a really positive direction. Well, I'm, you're, raising a, you're raising a really interesting issue. So, so if a thousand people type in the word Madonna, some number of them are looking for the singer and couldn't care less about the Christian issues. And some number of them have never even heard of the singer. Probably a smaller number, I'm just guessing. <laughs> um, but you don't know, or do you? That is, you could construct, you could set things up so that you did know, so that, so that you kept track of the user's history and previous searches and so forth, and you might have um, better than random information about whether they were looking for the, the singer or for the, the mother of Jesus. Um, failing that, you present 10 results. The 10 results may or may not include everything that the thousand different people who have typed the word Madonna in want. I presume, without having asked anybody, that, that uh, the results are constantly being influenced by some knowledge about what people click on, but there's got to be a limit to how far you can follow the user, unless they're using one of your toolbars or one of your operating systems. I don't know. I'm not asking. Um, and it all twists back to, to these other questions of serendipity, because you don't want it to be perfect. Maybe it's more valuable for a user who types in Madonna thinking about the pop star to be confronted with some of the other variations of Madonna. I don't know. I'm beginning to get tangled up. I think that's a very interesting point in terms of um, at least part of the signal that we get from a search point of view is in essence the popularity of a concept or popularity of a website. So. Um, that could certainly skew things in a certain way. 
but I'm also thinking back to your comparison between like uh, the role of Google and the role of like an editor in, uh, for New York Times, for instance. I think one difference that I see is like in a way, I can look at a search that someone conducts as almost like a conversation, where I'm looking for, let's say, Madonna, and I get back a, a set of results that maybe that's not what I expected or what I wanted. Then I basically go, okay, well maybe I want to search for Madonna and something else. Mm -hmm. Um, in a way, that's almost like a real-time conversation that's going on between the, the, the user and the search engine. Mm -hmm. First, it's like an editor. You get the feedback through maybe letters from your, your readers, but that's like after the fact. And by the time like you get the letters, like the feedback is kind of like you moved on to the next thing already. So maybe that's a little bit of a difference. Right. So you can you can keep track of what the what the user's next search is, and then the search after that, and put the, and put the information together. Uh, to some extent, it's also like what you said about like the, the click is a signal, right? So if the user is clicking on something, that's a signal that, that gets back to us. And go, okay, well, we may be doing a reasonable job in terms of returning the results. Yeah. There's limits, as you say. But. Uh, there are obviously also limits to the extent to which you're able to judge algorithmically whether sources are reliable or not. I mean, s some of you have suggested that that's part of the equation too, but... Um, and it is with other crowdsourced information enterprises like Wikipedia, there is some process of zeroing in on what one would consider the truth, at least some kind of accuracy. And yet, um, you know, the number of people who think that Barack Obama was not born in the United States remains staggeringly large, and, and there is a significant web presence. And, um, I think a, a live example of good crowdsourcing that I that I mention in the book is is um, one I'm sure you're all familiar with because it's so often cited as Google's um, ability to make accurate predictions about the spread of flu ep epidemics faster than the Centers for Disease Control based on what people are searching for and where. Um, on the other hand, if Google is swept along by hoaxes or fads or misinformation, I don't think that necessarily means that Google is not doing its job. It may be that that's the model that you've chosen, that you're not supposed to be arbiter, arbiters of truth. To some extent, again, news organizations, um, I believe, are less and less inclined to be arbiters of truth and more um, neutral reporters of what people think and what people argue about. It's either way, it's a mixed blessing. Yeah. I think there's a, a, some, some concepts of authority that I'd like to tease out and then see if we can isolate parts of this argument. But I will say one thing, which is uh, if Google is a mirror of the desires of humanity, uh, it's, it's in some sense our problem and in some sense not that you don't like what that reflection is looks like right and so we do want to be arbiters of not just popularism but some semblance of a closer to authoritative truth but there's so many the concepts of authority being tossed about here one is the authority of the actual author of the whatever whatever is to be read and the other is the authority of a curator to choose things that you should read whether or not you should whether or not you even knew you should be reading about them Topics you didn't think about, like India, or, or uh, concepts that you hadn't been exposed to because they're new. And then there's the authority of the answer to the question you asked, which is a search engine's authority. I, in my opinion, it's not necessarily the job of a search engine, whom you've made a request to, to be serendipitous. If, if, I, if, you, if you search for Madonna and we start showing you things about maybe bands related to Madonna that you didn't know about, which is serendipitous, that seems a bit of a stretch since you did ask us about Madonna. It seems only right of us to give you maybe a variety of, of different topics saying this is a general query. Could you explain which Madonna you were looking for with another refinement or by giving, by giving us more information? But that sense of authority, I think the problem of authority that we are more concerned about is what flags do we use uh, electronic or semantic or otherwise to, to, to determine who has given the best answer on the web to the question the user's answering, asking. And these are the things you talk about people gaming through blogs or what have I don't think blogs really float up as much as people claim they do to the top of our results. Sometimes they do. Mm -hmm. But 
you know, just from your study of information, how do you determine when you did your research? How do you, how do you determine what is authoritative source? What's a source you should trust? Not an editor, but the writer of the content itself. What, what are you looking at? Oh, me, who, me? <laughs> Please, as a source well, of authority, who I trust. <laughs> yeah, well, the, I began as a newspaper reporter, and so that's one, there are various old-fashioned um, paths to an answer to that question, but one of the old-fashioned techniques is you go out, you interview people, and then you interview more people, and um, unfortunately, you have a deadline, and so you run out of time, and newspapers are f full of errors. Um, newspapers also have copy editors with experience who can catch some of these errors. Then, uh, for me, the time scales get longer because now I'm working on a magazine article or a book and I have more time. But, um, you know, these days, there, are, as, as I'm sure you know, lots of, lots of different sorts of institutions have absolute rules against trusting Wikipedia as a factual source. If you're a newspaper reporter and you make a mistake and you tell your editor, well, I got that from Wikipedia, you're, you're toast. <laughs> Likewise, if, if you're a, um, a college student and you turn in a paper, I, I'm pretty sure at most places the rule is Wikipedia is not a trustworthy source. Nevertheless, it's also true that Wikipedia is incredibly reliable and incredibly valuable. I spent a lot of time, I'm not ashamed to admit, looking things up in Wikipedia when I was working on my book. Um, I spent even more time using Google Books, even while I was participating in the lawsuit against it. <laughs> Call me a hypocrite if you want. Um, everything in a book is not trustworthy. And the great thing about the flood of information, the flood being the last word of my subtitle, is that you get to be your own curator. You get to pick and choose, and you have to you have to exercise judgment. It's um, it's a challenge and it's a responsibility. Certainly. So um, I may horror of horrors represent you know like a dying older generation, at, you know, at least at Google. But um, I am very much willing to pay for editorial expertise, and I think a lot of other people are in various ways, right? So basically, the New York Times does have to change its business model. You know, some people will only pay with their attention, whereas other people will pay, you know, with money. They probably won't pay for the paper subscription anymore. I subscribed all my life until a few years ago, and then I stopped. You know, I was a Times Premium subscriber, and then they refunded my money. I'm not quite sure why they did that. Um, but so, you know, I guess my point is that there are certain, you know, just jewels of editorial expertise um, in this country. The Times is one of them. Um, and my gosh, I hope they don't give up. Um, I'm sure there's a way for them to monetize what they have. Um, they may not know what it is yet, and I hope they keep looking. Uh, I hope you're right. I'm not completely sure. And there's a, you know, there's a technical issue that, that I don't, see an ideal solution for, or I'm not sure there's even a good solution, and that is, once it's online, it's so easily transmittable. A lot of the ability of people to make money as inter information providers in the old world had to do with inconvenience, paper, you know, libraries. Um, the New York Times wants the Huffington Post to be a, an amplifier and a source of readers, but it doesn't want the Huff, Huffington Post to, to then eat its lunch by, being, by providing enough of the material that people don't need to then you know, pay the times for it. It's the, same, it's the same for me. You can read, you don't have to pay $10? Subsidized. <laughs> <Don't worry. laughs> um, <laughs> be still my heart. <laughs> You don't have to. You don't have to pay ten dollars. You can read a substantial amount of the of the book free right now online. I don't know exactly how much. I hope it's not a very satisfying reading experience. I hope that every so often you're interrupted with a, a page that you can't read. But, <laughs> but, but there's no question that some number of people who in the old world would have bought the book just to read ten pages about something, will no longer have to. Um, the Times can. They've, they've got my, they'll get my money, whatever kind of firewall they'll put up, and I see they have yours, but, but 
they will not be able to prevent people from transmitting all or part of some of those articles. And once they do that, I'm not sure if there's enough left. I don't, I don't know. So two things. Uh, one is, I think there are people who will read 10 pages of your book who wouldn't have read any of it before because it's so easy to read those 10 pages online. And of right. those, there are a fraction who will then go out and buy the whole thing, and not for 10 bucks either. Um, Actually, I'm an author, too, um, and my, my work is widely pirated. You know, you can download my entire books. But, you know, I don't, I don't begrudge that, and, and actually people are still buying the books. So, you know, I think that um, I I'm basically seem to be more optimistic than you are about this. The other thing is I visit the New York Times website multiple times a day, and I look at the entire front page, and I kind of wish it was more like the front page of the physical paper. Um, because, you know, I thought that was an interesting selection of news. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm not willing to give up on this idea that, you know, we have people we trust. And it, it isn't just trust, by the way, it's also people whose aesthetics we agree with. You know, there are other publications that I read simply because, you know, I, I this will be interesting. You know, I may not even believe a lot of what's in here, but I know that, you know, these guys have an interesting slant and I'd like to read it. Um, yes, it's easy to transmit the information. Yes, it's all just bits. But on the other hand, you know, the people who are just transmitting the bits don't care about providing the same experience that the people who originate them do. Um, by the way, the people who really get screwed here, of course, are musicians. Because there, you know, it really is a bit for bit copy. Um, you know, musicians and filmmakers and so forth. That's a harder problem, you know, you can tell us your thoughts on that if you like. Yeah. No, actually, I want to tell you my thoughts on another thing you just said, which is, yes, um, I too wish that the online front page of the New York Times was more like the physical front page. And I, I described how that's structured in a, what's supposed to be a meaningful way. On the other hand, I consult the online page 10 times a day. And I don't expect it to be the same every time. I don't expect it to be the same when I come back. So there's a, there's a dynamic information problem that nobody has a good solution to. It's not enough for them to know that I've already been there or even what I've read. Okay. One comment on seeing it online like the front page. Oh, okay. One comment on seeing it like the front page. Um, if all subscribers, at least I get the Sunday paper, um, they have a version you can download called Replica which yeah. is the front page, even though it's kind of inconvenient to remember to go yeah. get the replica. But That's if true. you're craving that, it's there. <laughs> OK. Sorry, you were, you were next. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I apologize. I'm going to change the topic a little bit. You were talking before about Shannon uh, and about the possibility that information is maybe this broader concept uh, that maybe has some philosophical implication. Or you know, I'm in particular interested in the physical implication. You know, so Shannon defines this quantity entropy, and it turns out to be exactly the same thing that's studied in thermodynamics. Yeah. And I've never sort of gotten a good explanation of what that's all about, and I wonder if you could sort of oh, great. have anything to say about I, that. Yes, you're not going to get a good explanation from me right this second, because it's really hard. But it is in the book. There's a whole chapter about entropy in the book, um, and Maxwell's demon. And it's just uh, it's too much for this. It's too much for my little brain in this in this context. I'll I'll just tell this joke that um, that um, what you said is exactly correct. By the way, that when Shannon worked out the mathematics of um, probabilities of a message, they, it turned out that the mathematics absolutely mirrored. Uh, what already existed in therm thermodynamics. And he started using the word entropy practically as a synonym for, for information. And uh, what they, there was the, the urban legend that went around at Bell Labs was that John von Neumann had, had advised Shannon to use the word entropy because then no one would know what he meant. <laughs> Very nice. We have time for uh, just one more question. Thank you so much for your, for your talk. Um, I have a question from a different angle from what we've been talking about. We've been talking a lot about how people get information, how it's changed, the problems with it, maybe the opportunities around that. But what I'd like your thoughts on is, given that things have changed, and we are, there is a demand for perhaps 
more information, but people are getting these filtered informations that's our own filter and all these things that we talked about. Um, how do you think the world will go, should go, could go to um, more effectively uh, can, um, work with the evolving media world to uh, have an ef most effective dialogue around politically sensitive data-rich issues. And let me throw out there a specific issue that you can focus on as an example, mm -hmm. which would be climate change. So there's a lot of issues in terms of open and transparency, which has to do with a lot of digital activity and emails and so forth. There's a lot of political issues. People can find what they want. There's science issues. Siloed scientists aren't used to this world. What do, you, what do you sort of think about where we are today in terms of the scientific communication to the world and the policy around it? Yeah, I, I guess I, I can sum this up by saying things are kind of a mess and uh, we're in what I think may be a period of adjustment. I hope it's a period of adjustment. I'm not sure what are the easy answers to, to these questions. Climate change is you know, such a canonical example in a way. 20 years ago when I was a science reporter at the New York Times, I remember I'm, I wrote a few things about particular small pieces of the climate change puzzle and it, never, it didn't occur to me at that time that there was going to be the least bit of controversy about it. It was all pretty straightforward. It was not politicized. It has become so intensely po politicized there are so many people who, even to talk about whether you believe in climate change, you know, like believing in God, strikes me as kind of weird. It should have been a technical kind of knowledge, a non-political kind of knowledge. We all know why that's not the case. It's because of the influence of money on so, much, on so many of our channels of information. In the case of climate change, I think it's very clear. Um, there are industries, the oil and gas industry, that spend a lot of money on um, pseudo think tanks. They pay researchers, in my opinion, to lie. There are other people who unconsciously and without evil intent f find their views distorted by uh, misinformation that that comes from these sources, and you know, don't I won't even get started on Fox News. But um, but I'm I guess what I'm stumbling around trying to say is that there is no no real purity in our complicated world in in um, the sources of information, and and it, there's just ever more of a challenge for us consumers of information to watch out and be skeptical. And the same thing applies to information about pharmaceuticals and, and, and to more obviously political subjects. And it applies in more subtle ways to things that are even less political or connected to money. Um, this company so far, I think, has been doing a pretty good job. And people should remain nervous about it. You're a profit-making enterprise, too. Um, try to do no evil. Thank you all. <laughs>